it's fine. Hello everyone, we're doing a quick video, hopefully quick, on how to make strip plots using Sparky. And so we're going to work with Randy's R2AB data uh, and we're going to make some HNCO and HNCOCA strips for his poster. Well, actually for Taylor's poster. So, uh, what I've done here is I've opened up Sparky and you can see we have a, a fairly well assigned uh, HSQC or Trozy in this case. Uh, that's kind of what you need to start with. Um, to my knowledge, there's no way to save the strips that Sparky makes when it helps you do assignments. Uh, and so if you're trying to do publication quality or poster quality uh, strip plots, then that's what really this video is for, to sort of show you how to do that. And so to start with, uh, Randy has uh, four or five residues we're going to do here. We'll probably increase it because I think we can probably do uh, seven or eight uh, just as quickly as we do four or five, but uh, we'll get the general idea at least. Um, the first thing you want to do is you want to start setting up your windows uh, in Sparky so that you have a consistent zoom uh, for all of the HNCO and HNCOCA or HNCOCA and HNCA peaks that you want to do. And looking at this, uh, it looks like our strip plot goes from about 42 ppm upfield down to 60-ish eh, um, downfield. Uh, we probably didn't need to record all of that, but that's the default that Brooker uses, and it's passable. So um, what we want to do is we want to set up these windows so that they contain the complete sweep width in the carbon dimension. And so uh, if you look here, I have uh, 13C and 1H as my axes here, and then nitrogen is the Z axis. And I can bring up the peak names by typing XA. And there you see that for that. Uh, I can also type V capital C uh, to bring up the um, contour levels for these spectra. And we might have to tweak that later on, so that's not a bad thing to have either. Uh, notice we're using the newer NMR fam version of Sparky, so that's where all these additional contour level and controls come from. Okay, so let's uh, let's set up our, our zoom here. Um, we're going to do from probably 43 ppm down to, I'm going to say 64 ppm. It should be plenty. And to start with this, we're going to type RT uh, to bring up our region list. You can see what I have here is a is a list of uh, regions, and or a list of ppm. You can take that for you too. Um, and for the HNCOCA, you can see it it goes from the current zoom level 51 to 64. Uh, as I said, we're going to change that to 43, and I think we said um, yeah, 64 is probably fine. Uh, but the reason we're using the region list is because it will allow you to get the exact zoom uh, that you specify. And so I'm going to put that, those numbers in there. I don't really care about the other ones for now. I'm going to switch my pointer mode to zoom, and I'm going to hit apply mode. And what you can see that that's done is it's basically fixed my zoom level of this window. Um, now I can go here to the HNCA, and I can do the exact same thing. So 43. 64, apply mode, and now I know that these two windows are zoomed into the exact same amount, and that'll be useful when making strips. Uh, as kind of a roadmap to what we're going to be doing, we're going to be basically setting up our strips using these two windows, saving them as PostScript files, and then loading them into Illustrator and manually uh, dragging the strips in. Uh, there are probably more efficient ways to do this, and it would be lovely if there were programmed to do it for you. Uh, but I haven't found anything that's quite as good or gives quite as uh, stunning a result as just doing it with Sparky and Illustrator like we're doing it here. So, uh, now what we need to do is we're going to start finding these residues. Uh, we're going to start with residue 838. And as you can see, uh, it looks beautiful here. Um, you know, here is our HNCA. We get the I and the I-1 peak. Here's the HNCOCA. You could just get the I-1. Um, I'm going to uh, adjust the window because I don't think we need uh, this much space. 
and if you're doing a single strip uh, that's probably fine uh, just to try to do it by eyeball Oops. Uh, if you're doing multiple strips like we're doing here what you might want to do is try to you know get it as close as possible so that you can have them be identical um, you can get very very particular and even anal retentive with this kind of stuff um, I find that it's not so useful um, to pick on it that much um, but this way it'll try to ensure that when you get something as as good as possible on your final result it'll look really nice so now we have strips of about equal width they're encompassing the entire width of the peak they have the entire sweep width of carbon in there and that'll make it really really easy to print out and so what we're going to do is we're going to go over here and um, basically we're ready to start so i'm going to click into the window that i want to print file print and what you can see at that that accelerator is PT um, and looking here it gives us pretty much the reasons that we want uh, you don't really have to mess with this stuff I generally recommend for strips using the portrait so you leave landscape unchecked uh, whether or not you use a banner is up to you uh, as long as you're consistent is what really makes the difference and then the final thing that you want here is you want to set your your proton label spacing at about, uh, I think we were using 0.25 ppm the other day. Uh, you can test that to see what, what works best for you. And we're going to test these first couple of strips just to make sure that they look reasonable. Um, but once you set those settings up, we're going to print the HNCOCA. So we just hit save. And we're not in the right directory, but that's fine. We're going to go here to Randy. You always like to see lots of NMR data when your students are making making their notebooks, so that's good. Right, Randy? Yes. And getting close. So we'll save it under lists, which I think is where. And since this is G838, we'll just call it 838hncoca.ps. Um, you can save it whatever you want, but it's best to do something that you're going to remember because we're going to be generating a lot of these. Uh, now we can just select HNCA. You can see it's pretty much the same. It keeps all that good stuff. And, and part of this is just getting quick at being able to optimize. But OK, so now we have those two strips saved. And in our directory with Sparky, uh, I can go here into lists. Uh, not lists. Yeah, lists. And you can see those two, two uh, postscript files that we just saved. Uh, just for making things a little bit easier on you, the viewer, I'm going to make a directory called temp. And I'm going to move all of the um, other files in here into temp until we're, uh, until we're done. And that way it'll hopefully make things easier for everybody. Okay, so now the only two files are there. Um, I'm a big fan of GV for viewing PostScript files. And so if we look at our HNCA file, it should look reasonable. And what you see that there's some stuff that we obviously will have to fix, um, but the y-axis is very nice and consistent. 
the x-axis is consistent, the tick marks on the x-axis are not ridiculous. You can't really see the z-axis because it's buried up here in this tiny little box. Uh, and we'll have to deal with that later. Uh, no way around it. But um, this, this actually looks pretty good. And again, just to confirm, we can look at the HMCOCA. Also looks very good. And most importantly, it's consistent. Right? That's what really what you want for a strip plot. Okay, so now <coughs> we can kind of go through on automatic. And the nice thing is that if you have this set up, uh, you can pretty much just do it without thinking too hard uh, for as many residues as you want to do. And so we were at 838. We're going to go here to 839. And what we should hopefully see is, yep, um, again, those strips should come through. Um, Randy has done here uh, so that you can see that the peaks have been picked in the HNCA and the HNCOCA. Uh, you may want to turn those off with, uh, I think it's L capital B, or maybe it's OS for ornament show, I can't remember. Um, but since they're just the peaks, it's fine, I think, to leave them in here. They're not, they're not very big, they're not obtrusive, they're not going to mess up our, our strip plot. So uh, now we hit save, and look at this, it even... Um, yeah, even kept the name for us. So we'll just get 839.ps. Um, again, we'll do our HNCOCA. And really, that's all we're going to keep doing, is we're going to go up and we're going to do maybe five or six of these. Um, again, it's fine if there's other residues peering in here. That's, that's a normal part of NMR. Uh, what's important is that it's centered on the residues that we want, and the fact that Sparky has this nice peak thing set up and all of our spectra are already synchronized, that makes it really easy for us. When setting this up, obviously you do need a Sparky project that has an assigned HSQC and you need something that will synchronize your HSQC to your strip plot uh, spectra as well. Now we're going to do 841. There's a little bit of a lag here, um, as you can tell. We're, we're using this from a uh, X11 type of a connection, so. Obviously here you can see this one's a little bit closer together. But right now, I mean, looking at all the residues we've done, our contour levels have been great. So no need to change that. Although your mileage may vary, you might have to go through and tweak your contours uh, after you've done a couple of strips, particularly if it looks like you're not picking up all the, uh, the residues that you want or the uh, resonances that you want. Uh, I do think it's very important to try to stay consistent, so you shouldn't jump around in contour levels as you go from one strip to the next. Uh, part of the idea of a strip plot is that it is representing the spectra under the same conditions for all of the residues just shifted around. And so if you're changing the contour levels, you're actually uh, manipulating the data in a way that's not realistic to what's, what the spectra actually look like. And so my best recommendation is to find a contour level and stick to it.
And if you need to change a contour level, at least put that in your figure when you report it, either in your poster or in your publication. Okay. Moving this back in, I look. We now have 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, and 44. So that's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I think that's a reasonable number here. Um, and again, just to confirm, it never hurts to double check. Our strip looks as beautiful as ever, so that's good. Now, uh, and I'll post a link to this, uh, but I have a patch file that I've developed several years ago um, that helps take a look at Sparky PostScript files and, and tweaks them so that they're a little bit better suited uh, for publication purposes. And on our server, um, that file is called Sparky PS Changes. And if you look at look at that file, I mean it's it's just a patch. Um, to change things like font size and and tick lengths and whether the banner is shown, um, Sparky does a really nice job of making beautifully defined PostScript files. And so, not every PostScript file that you look through is going to be this well written, uh, and that makes it easy to tweak a lot of things in Sparky. Uh, you can even go in and tweak things like your your uh, peak labels and whatnot, but. There are a few things that are easier to change and that if you have to do it for all of these, what, 16 files uh, can be a little, uh, 14 files can be a little cumbersome. And so we're going to do uh, patch and 838 HNCA. And the way patch works is you have to give it the patch file as direct input. And if I type sparky changes diff, Basically, when you see this patching file 838, that means it's it's doing this. Essentially, you can think of this as a find and replace. Um, and so the the patch file tells it what to find and what to replace it with, and the uh, patch program is actually what does that find and replace. And since all Sparky PostScript files are roughly the same in their header, it works. Uh, and so I'm going to go in and. Um, move our 838 HNCA to the temp directory since we just changed that already. Uh, here's where if you know some shell scripting you can save yourself some time. Um, but I'm going to run a for loop on all of the po postscript files and we'll do patch I think that'll work. Yep. So you can see this loop basically went through all the files and applied the patch. Uh, you could type that manually if you want, or you could learn shell scripting and save yourself some time. Uh, your choice. And so now again we have those 14 files. If we take a look at them, what have we actually done? You can see, one, we've turned off the banner up at the top. Uh, we've made the font size a little bit bigger. We've gotten rid of the omegas, and we've replaced them with Fs. Um, that's just personal preference. Uh, if you really wanted to be like IUPAC standard, you would probably move these numbers over to the, the right-hand side of the spectrum, but I don't think there's an easy way to do that in Sparky. Uh, the other things that we've done is we, we've made the tick marks a little bit longer, and the font sizes are bigger. And that will help when you start making these uh, in, in Illustrator and, and loading them in. Uh, but that's really all that, that patch file does. Uh, and if you really don't want to use it, you don't have to. Uh, I just think it makes for a slightly more readable strip plot. Okay. <coughs> so now we have some data. And really we're done with Sparky at this point. So I'm going to minimize Sparky um, just in case I need it for later. I probably won't close it all together. But what we need is we're going to bring our strips over to a Windows computer Okay. 
Apparently I already have a directory called strips, but whatever. And so there is our strips directory. And you can open up your favorite trial file transfer program. And then you want to copy those strips to your Windows system. So we're using WinSCP, and it's nice and easy and fast. And the next thing, we will need Illustrator. So I'm going to load up Adobe Illustrator. I think we're done with that window too. And of course, Illustrator opens all over the place on my desktop, so I'm dragging it in. I'm using a slightly older version of Illustrator. You do not need the fastest and latest edition to do what we're going to do here today. Uh, in fact, probably the older versions work just as well, or maybe even better. Okay, so we have all these PostScript files. The great thing is about Illustrator is it opens PostScript files natively. Uh, you do have to tell it a little bit or give it some information. And so it does complain that it can't find a particular font. Um, that's fine, you just ignore that. If you want to change it later, you can always change the fonts if you want. And then it's going to ask you about the color mode. Uh, for my purposes, I think it's best to use RGB, uh, just so everything's con consistent. I'm not sure exactly what in this file is different color modes. Uh, I've never probed that, but I'm just going to load in RGB. And what you can see is it brings in your strips. And the nice thing about Illustrator is you can just continue to drag these into the top window, or the top window bar, I don't know what you'd call that. And I'm using my keyboard to help me out here because it saves me some key mouse clicks. And so we've got 838, 39, 40. And that's probably reasonable to start with for now. Uh, what we're going to have to start doing, though, is putting these all into a single document. Um, that's interesting. Okay, that looks legit. 39 HNCA, 39 HNCOCA, that looks fishy. Uh, we might have to make some of these again, so, but that's okay. It's what we're here to learn. I'm trying to channel my inner Bob Ross. Okay, let's, uh, let's go back into our Sparky. Yeah, that looks okay. I don't know if we just saved it wrong. Uh, maybe I didn't click on the right window, but um, yeah, it's no problem. Again, that's that's not going to be the slow part. Um, although for quickness, let's see which one of these we really need to remake, because that'll maybe save us some time. So 838 looks like this. If I yeah, that looks fine. Also looks fine. Looks 
fine. Yeah, that one I think was wrong. So the 839 HMCA. Oops. Absolutely. Ah, it looks better. Okay, eight forty. Let's see what we're dealing with there. Yeah, even a stray keystroke can maybe screw things up if you're uh, not paying attention. And that's probably what happened here. 840, that looks right. Yeah, now there, that doesn't look right. So. COCA say Yep. And that looks good. We'll check the rest of them here because why not? It never hurts to check your work. <coughs> Looks good. So it looks like maybe every other one that we did, it might be a sparky print window thing. Um, and so maybe if you're in doubt, you would want to go in and close that print window, open it up so that it makes sure that you make sh sure that it updates all of the uh, zoom levels and whatnot. Um, obviously, you don't have to worry about proton and nitrogen; those are set on the or proton and carbon; those are set on the screen. But it might be that it's not updating the nitrogen. Um, in either case, saving this and just checking your work is probably the way to go, regardless. That looks correct again. So we are doing up to, so my prediction would be that the HNCA here would look good, but maybe not the HNCOCA. That looks fine. And that one looks off. So I'm just going to close the window, click on the window I want to do, type PT to bring it up, hit save, update the file name, save, yes, patch it, check it. So maybe not the most convenient thing, but still, once you get in the mindset and you kind of reach that flow state, it's not uh, it's not going to be hard. Looks 
good. HMCA probably looks bad. Yeah. So close that window, click here, PT, save. The nice thing about Sparky is that it does save the settings, like the uh, line or the PPMs act or PPM labels. So you don't have to type that every single time. Preemptively remake this last HNCOCA strip. Perfect. Okay. Now, take two. Maybe you can hear my neighbor. Our walls are rather thin. But that's okay. Okay, so strips. We'll copy all of these over again. We'll overwrite them. And now, bring up Illustrator. if you just drag all these in. And I'm just going to hit enter a whole bunch. What's most important is that if you're going to do it in bulk, that it doesn't screw up the ordering. Because that's absolutely something you don't want to have to mess around with later. And it looks like everything's in order, so that's good. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're basically just going to start copying. And for a strip plot like this, since you're working from low to high, uh, it makes the most sense to put the HNCO first and then the HNCA, or the HNCOCA first and then the HNCA. And so we're just going to keep working it this way. Now it's not super important that everything stays aligned, but it does make your life somewhat easier. And it's not super important that everything stays equally spaced. But it does make your life somewhat easier. And so I'm using the keyboard. I'm holding shift and pressing the arrow keys. And that's allowing me to move a reasonable amount of space. It's still not quite as big. Um, what's most important, though, is that you don't mix anything up. So if you... If you use the mouse or if you use the arrow keys, it doesn't matter to me as long as you just sort of keep everything in the right order.
It is extremely helpful when doing this kind of work to know all the keyboard shortcuts. And so when I use them, I try to talk about them. So here, for example, I'm doing Control A, Control C to select everything and then to copy it. And so you can see we're getting quite a few strips here. And this will eventually form kind of our This is big enough and I'm just going to drag it with my mouse. And this will eventually form the basis of our strip plots. Uh, you can hold shift and that keeps it on a horizontal plane, just like most Microsoft products. Closing the ones you don't need will also free up some memory. Okay. Now, just so something crashes, I'm going to save this as strips.ai. This is what we'll start with as we work. Save. Hit OK. And now we can close these other windows, which will make life easier. Okay, so now we have this massive collection of strips. How do we make this into a nice looking strip plot? And so here's where using Illustrator's tools to sort of help things uh, can make your life way, way easier. And so the first thing, you know, since I've done everything kind of automatically copied and pasted, uh, it actually has kept everything pretty reasonable. Uh, I'm going to bring up the rulers. And I'm going to create for myself a guide. Actually, I'm going to zoom in first. And so I just drag from the ruler into the thing. And you can see I have Smart Guides enabled. And it's basically picking up the top of all of these strip plots. And you can see that they, you know, I've done a pretty good job of maintaining them all in the same 
footing. Uh, maybe with the exception of these last two. Yeah, you can definitely see that they're... At this point, everything is grouped together, so I'm going to click on that path, and I'm just going to move that little guy down so that it... intersects with that. You could zoom in if you wanted, if you want more precision. But this looks pretty good looking at the tops of all of my strips. So that means I don't really have to move them up or down at all, which is kind of what you want in this circumstance. Um, we still have a lot of data, so I'm going to hit select all of them. At this point, I can ungroup them. And what that will mean for these guys is it will mean that I can start removing things like these ad additional superfluous labels. Right? We're not going to label every single proton dimension here. That would just be nuts. But I'll keep one of them because that is probably nice to have. Um, the same would go with all of this stuff on the middle. Like We don't need to label the... the um, the y-axis on all of these, right? And so I can go in and just start deleting those. Uh, we'll probably keep one on each end. But we certainly don't need them for all of the, all of the strips. And since they're not grouped anymore, it's not going to complain. Um, this is another feature that Sparky has where... Oops. If the postscript file were written differently, uh, switch to the pointer modes. Uh, if the postscript file were written differently, this would be much harder to do. But the postscript file is actually written really nice to make sure that this this kind of manipulation is very easy. And like I said, we'll keep that guy. Um, and then I'm just going to move that. Now it's starting to look a little bit more like strips. Um, here again, I don't think we need tick marks and tick labels for all of the internal strips. Um, Sparky has these so that they're pretty much paired. So if you select one side, notice how it selects both. Um, and so that's another thing that I can go through and delete. Again, holding down the shift brings up my hand tool that makes it much easier to just sort of move around within Sparky or within Illustrator. So I'll be the first to admit that this is labor intensive. And hey, if you want to write a program that'll do it for me, then I will be happy to do another YouTube video advertising your program. Oops, didn't want to do that last one. Okay, so the last and the first ones are different because I don't want to remove them from both sides. I just want to remove them from one side. And so to do that, I select those tick marks. I go up here to Object, Compound Path, Release. And I do not know that keyboard shortcut. But now you see when I do that, it allows me just to select the, the ticks on one side of the strip. And I'll do the same for this. Object, compound path, release. And now I can just select the ones on the right-hand side. Bam. OK, so now we've got to get the strips positioned so that they're close to one another. Uh, there'll be some other things here that we fix, like, you know, some of the stuff down here. Um, I'm not real crazy about this 9.8, 9.5 stuff. We can probably edit that uh, later. Uh, the rest of them look like, like they're pretty reasonable, with the exception of this one over here. So if we want to switch that, we can just hit delete, and that'll clear off our, our x-axis a little bit. 
again, very few people use strips. You know, they're, they're, it's, it's good to have the information, but most people aren't using the strips to pull out the actual proton PPM. And so if you need to get rid of one of your labels, you're probably okay. Okay, so now we got, how, do, how do we get these things closer? Because right now it's pretty big. Um, this is a little secret I've used many times. Um, I basically use a little spacer element. So here I made a little rectangle that I think is going to be about the distance that I want. And now all I got to do is hold shift and use Illustrator's strip or uh, Smart Guides tool to basically help me position my strips so that they're close together. And in this case, I didn't quite. Yeah, I wasn't quite as close as I thought I was going to be. So but we'll, we'll touch it up. There we go. Um, Smart Guides and Illustrator does change modes a little bit if you can hold down the control key. And so if you find that it's not sticking to what you want it to stick to, you can always try uh, you can always try holding the control key and see if that maybe helps get what you need to get. But this little ruler trick works in lots of programs. It works in PowerPoint. Um, it works in Publisher, if you're using Publisher. And clearly it works in Illustrator as well. It probably works best in Illustrator because Illustrator has the best smart guide feature. I've never quite found another program that has the same kind of capabilities when it comes to guides. We're getting a little bit far off here, so I'm going to move these in. Oops. Given the time we have, we might not be able to get a full complete strip plot here. See, there is a case I had to hold down the um, the control key for it to give me the right behavior. The goal here when using Illustrator to do any kind of graphic manipulation of your graphs is to make sure that you're not manipulating your data at all. And so that's where the, the Smart Guides feature really helps you because it means that you never have to worry about, you know, if you adjust an axis label, is it really the same label spacing, or are you just fooling yourself and making it what you want it to be? Although certainly Illustrator does take practice. But we're just about done for this set of strips. <coughs>
Notice I haven't deleted the, any of those nitrogen stuff, any of those nitrogen information, because uh, we're going to need that later on. Okay, so that is a reasonable size, set of strips. They're spaced nicely. Uh, there's a little bit of crowding down here at the 10 versus the 9.5, but I'm okay with that for here. And we probably want this guy centered. Um, but again, I'm okay with that for now. Um, the next question becomes, let's, let's try to get this sort of nice. Uh, there's a couple of things that we still need to do. We need to put our nitrogen chemical shifts up here at the top possibly with a label of what residues are which. Uh, that's easy enough to do. Um, but just to show you some features here, I think before we need to wrap up, I want to try to keep this video less than an hour. Uh, one, if I use this, this tool um, for the magic wand, and I bring up my magic wand window, uh, notice if you bring up the magic wand window here, it shows up here. You can use this to actually help you um, change things like line thickness, right? And so for a lot of publications, the line thickness of, that Sparky uses is pretty weak. And so if I click stroke color and stroke weight and dial those tolerances down to zero, <coughs> what that lets me do is, is use the... Um, the magic wand tool and now I can basically select all of my peaks um, and I can group them together Oops. I guess first I need to ungroup anything that's currently there uh, there's probably some clipping masks going on here um, but key point though here if, if I want to change the line thickness Maybe the journal says you've got to use a minimum thickness of 0.5 points. You can see that that allows you to rapidly do that kind of a transformation. And that would be thick enough, I think, for any journal that you would want to do. Um, if you needed to, you could bring back that magic wand tool. And sometimes you've got to go here to, um, to release the clipping mask. not there. This is one area where there is some inconsistency in how Sparky handles things. Like for example, sometimes I find that it, you know, this one probably definitely has a clipping mask. This one I'm sure will as well. Alt control 7 to try. Anytime where the peaks go off the screen, you're going to be looking at a situation where Sparky will create a clipping mask for you. Fortunately, it's a clipping mask that you can undo and it still doesn't unclip all of the stuff that's outside of that box. That's where you would have to worry about it. Now, let's try this. This might let me uh, select them all. And if I go in here to layers, mm, my layers I'm already out. So if I bring up my layer window, create a new layer, I should be able to drag that into that separate layer, and that lets me hide all of my peaks if I want to. And so they're on a separate layer now. I can do a, you know, and that'll become useful when you're making the, um, the uh, lines or the traces through the strips. And since we're talking about traces through the strips, I think this is a good point to, or a good time to do that. And so I always do traces using uh, a different layer because I think it makes it much easier. Uh, I will typically lock the lower layer so that they can't be manipulated and what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to use my guides 
to set up my traces. And what you can see is, is if this is done right, if you have good strips, those three axes, the I, I minus one I, will all align nicely with each other. And that's what this, the whole purpose of the strip is, is to show that you can get those lined up. So now, I'm going to bring up my pen tool. And here's where having those, uh, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Here's where having those little peak labels can actually help you because they let you, uh, they make it somewhat easier uh, to find the middle of the, the strips. So I'm going to use labels for those two. And basically I, I draw through the HNCAs because that's where it makes the most sense to draw the con continuity or continuity. And so this is going to get pretty grid heavy. Uh, lots of lots of labels here on the or lots of uh, grid lines, but say la vie, that's what you need. You don't want to run the risk of not having a, uh, a nice clean a uh, nice clean line. Okay, so we're going to start here and there's no no harm in uh, Here's where it's useful to be able to hide the peaks. All right. So I'm going to go click, click. Click. I'll find that it's clicking with me. be a little easier if I draw bring up my there we go. Now obviously I'm not going to keep this red.
It's red, but it's easy enough to change. Actually, and within the type window, you can make it a dashed line. Uh, two points is probably fine, but that's pretty good as far as uh, looking like it's showing you what the assignments are. Um, if you want, you could maybe make this uh, slightly different. No, not 11 points. Okay. So, um, a couple more things we need to do. Not zoom in like mad, that's for sure. <coughs> Notice that we have all this stuff up here, and so we're going to sort of sort of cut the uh, cut this at the end, and I'll just sort of give you a general idea. So first of all, if I want to, I can use Sparky, um, that magic wand tool, and I'll have to unlock my layers. But I can use Sparky to select the outer lines and these small narrow lines because I guarantee you that those narrow tick marks are probably going to be too narrow as well. And if you group those together, then you never have to worry about using the smart the magic wand tool again. Um, and that might be necessary because if you make them all the same, you might not be able to use the magic wand tool to differentiate them after you set them all to one point, for example. Um, but anyway, what we need to do now is basically there we, go. Um, we need to be able to identify the nitrogen strips or the strip thickness for or the strip position in the nitrogen dimension for all of these guys. Um, again, that'll take some time to do it correctly, but we're going to need to get bring back our little box because that little box, you can see that has a little handle in the middle that I can use now to center my guide. You know, both of these paired strips for the HNCO and the HNCO or the HNCA and the HNCOCA have the same nitrogen plane, so we don't need to worry about we don't need to worry about labeling them both. Uh, and at this point, if you wanted to clear out some of your other guides, you probably could do so. I'm just going to do this for these three for the sake of time. Oops. I guess right now I don't have lock guides on, so. But I'm going to remove these spacer boxes. And I can remove these other guides too. What the heck? Okay. So you see what that does is it gives me a, an anchor point so that I can then center some text there. And I'm going to do that two ways. So I'm going to bring up my character window, paragraph, I'll center it. Um, Myriad Pro is probably fine. You could also do Arial. And I'm going to do Control-Alt semicolon, which will lock my guides again. Click there. And now, 107.7. Uh, So again, that's the PPM value that I'm getting off of those guys. And this was glycine 138. So I'll click that intersect, G138. I can just copy and paste, oops.
nine. And then out here, if you want it to be right justified, you can do that. Um, so here under parag or no character, you can select superscript. down to the right line and you can align it with whatever you want but and so really the only other thing that you might want to do here you can uh, certainly move that if you want to want to um, the only other thing that you might want to do is maybe make these bold and then obviously you want to get rid of this stuff in the middle and that's not as easy as it sounds because for whatever reason I mean this is not uh, you know, it's uh, it's not grouped together and so you've got to go in and select it manually and delete it but it's not terrible to do either but once you copy that nitrogen chemical shift down yeah, you know, there's no point in saving it. And it just clutters up your strip with really what's unreadable text that nobody's going to be interested in anyway. So. And that's pretty much it. I mean, we'd have to go through and do that for the rest of them. Uh, I can go into Artboards and fit to artwork bounds and that will bring me uh, my artboard back to you know exactly what the strip covers but and again I think that's probably uh, it's probably too much space up there between the the residue identifier and the chemical shift um, but uh, that's pretty much it and you would have to finish up the nitrogen labeling for the rest of the strips, but then I'd say, you know, this looks pretty passable for a strip plot. And so uh, thank you if you're watching this for sticking with us for an hour and 10 minutes. Um, I hope you uh, enjoy this and find it useful, and I hope you have beautiful NMR data just like this.